Hey guys, my name is Lee Morris with fstoppers.com and today I've got the new Nikon D810 camera and you're probably wondering, is this camera worth the money? Is it worth the upgrade? And I'll go ahead and tell you that if you're in the market for a brand new full frame DSLR camera, I believe this is the best camera money can buy with the features, with everything that this camera does. It's really unbelievable for $3,300. But the difficult question is, and the question that I have to ask myself is this camera actually worth upgrading to? I already own three D800 cameras. Is it worth me selling those cameras, losing thousands of dollars, and paying the extra money to get a few new features? Today we're gonna find out. So I've been a professional wedding photographer for about 10 years now, and I can remember being really excited every time Nikon came out with a new camera. If you guys can remember the jump from the Nikon D100 to the D200, it was massive. The image quality was so different. The ISO performance was so much better. Same thing from the D200 to the D300. It was like a completely different camera. It was unbelievable. As soon as that camera came out, your D200 was obsolete at that point. It just couldn't keep up with the new technology. But the problem is we're running into these issues of diminishing returns now. And when cameras get as good as the Nikon D800 was, can you really come out with a new camera every year, every two years that's revolutionary? The truth is the answer is no, and that's the reason that this is not called the Nikon D900. It's the D810. It's just an upgrade to the D800. But I'm like any other photographer, I enjoy having new gear. I love the newest features. I love having a camera that can take a little bit better picture or a little bit better video. And I currently own three D800 cameras. I use them to film videos. We're using one right now, two actually, uh, to film videos for f-stoppers, but I also use them to shoot weddings. So the question I have is, is it worth me selling my D800s to upgrade to the Nikon D810? And I thought, you know, if I could sell my cameras on eBay for 2,500 bucks, then it might be worth paying an additional $800. The problem is though, the Nikon D800 is now worth approximately $1,800 used online. That is a massive hit. I actually can't remember any of my cameras ever dropping that much in value. So the features on this new camera better be more than a slight upgrade for me to spend $4,500 upgrading three new cameras. So let's run through some of the features that this camera has updated, and then we'll get into all the tests that we did with this camera versus the D800 versus the Canon 5D Mark III. And we also threw in the new Sony FS700, which is the pro level video camera, just to compare a pro level video camera versus the video capabilities of the new D810. Now, obviously the feature that most people care about is the sensor in the camera. And this camera is the exact same megapixels. It's a 36 megapixel sensor, but apparently it's a totally new sensor. And so we were excited to see if it had significantly better ISO performance. I had heard that it was approximately a stop better in ISO performance. And so what we did was we did a lot of different tests. We took pictures in JPEG with the 800, the 810, and the 5D Mark III. We also took the exact same pictures in RAW. And what we found was there was a lot of differences here. When we shot in JPEG, there, was, there seemed to be a really significant difference with the ISO performance, but when we moved into RAW, we could get each of the cameras to look almost identical in the exact same ISO setting. And so what we found is, I believe that the 810 is slightly better with ISO, but it's not a full stop. It's probably approximately one third of a stop to a half stop, better ISO performance, and so that feature alone is definitely not worth the upgrade for this camera. The cameras today are endlessly better than the cameras that we were using professionally just a few years ago. So for us to nitpick about the 810 versus the 800 and one's professional and one's old technology and obsolete, it's just not the case. You know, you're gonna be able to take almost an identical picture with the 800, the 810, or the 5D Mark III. One very interesting feature that photographers that use strobe are gonna be really excited about is the native ISO or the lowest ISO that this camera can go to is now 64. It's one stop lower than the D800 or most other DSLRs, which is at 100 ISO. And what this gets you is the ability to stop down your ambient light even more if you are using strobe. So let's say you're outside, you're all the way up at the max 250th of a second uh, sync speed and you're at ISO 100, F2.8. You really wanna get that shallow depth of field. If you're on the D800, the only thing you can do to darken the picture more is to bump up your F-stop. 
But now with this camera, you have one more stop that you can go down. So you could go all the way down in ISO to 64. You could darken the sky a little bit more, bump up your uh, power pack or your strobe, and you can get a completely different looking shot. So it's kind of similar to a built-in neutral density filter, and I think a lot of photographers are gonna take advantage of that. If you happen to be shooting sports with this camera, you can now shoot 28 raw files in a row at the highest 14-bit rate, and uh, the buffer's not gonna fill up. That's double what it was on the D800. Uh, for me, as a wedding photographer, I am not just rapid firing pictures, so I will never use that feature. That's something that didn't really excite me very much. One thing that is really exciting about this camera is it has a new focusing system, and I haven't had a chance to shoot a real wedding with it, and I feel like once I do, I'm sure I'll be able to really see and feel the difference of that focusing speed, especially focusing in so much low light like you have to at wedding receptions. But apparently it's got the exact same focusing system as the new Nikon D4S, which is really cool. And I'm sure that if you're shooting in low light or you need really quick focusing for sports or something like that, you're really going to appreciate that. The autofocus on this camera also now has group focusing. So you can use four points to move them around the viewfinder. And if somebody's walking towards you, instead of a single point, you could have four. And it gives you a little bit more area to work with. Again, I haven't tested it, but I believe that's a feature that I'm going to use every single job I have. One thing that this camera can do that the D800 cannot do is it can shoot in small raw. Um, and it's interesting. It's something that when I heard of it, I thought, well, I could be interested in shooting small raw at weddings because 36 megapixels is really insane when you're shooting thousands and thousands of pictures. And so, you know, if I could shoot a 15 megapixel image and uh, deliver that, that would be much easier on my computer and my storage. And I'm already delivering pictures that size because I shrink them down before I give them to my clients. But this camera shoots nine megapixel raw files. The file sizes aren't that much smaller. I think we tested it and it was still almost 30 megabytes for a nine megapixel image. And we've also heard from a bunch of gearheads that it's not a real raw and it doesn't have all of the bit depth and blah, 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 blah. So I don't think that's a feature that I'm ever going to use. And I can't imagine anybody who buys a camera like this with 36 megapixel is going to say, you know what, I wish I could make that take a worse picture. Let me change the setting. You know, if you need more memory, just buy a bigger memory card. It really doesn't cost that much these days. One maybe insignificant feature to you is the new shutter sound. It's much more quiet with the DA10 than it was in the DA100. The quiet mode that both cameras have are significantly different now. And the quiet mode is pretty impressive. I was hoping that it would be silent. Um, from reading certain specs, I thought that they were going to be able to do something where they lifted the shutter and then the sensor would just grab images. Sadly, it cannot do that. It also has a quiet continuous mode. It's not silent. And I shoot weddings and churches all the time where the pastor says absolutely no photography whatsoever. I don't wanna hear any clicking but the videographer can film all day. And so if they could actually make a DSLR that doesn't require a shutter, uh, that would be a game changer. Not only would it be able to uh, be completely silent, you'd be, you'd be able to shoot weddings in complete silence, you'd be able to shoot movie sets in complete silence, but more importantly than that, if you don't have a shutter, you don't have to worry about sync speed anymore. So basically guys, it's small upgrades when it comes to the actual still photography that this camera can take. Nothing huge, but if autofocus is something that's really important to you, then you might be tempted to upgrade just for that feature alone. But the biggest thing that this camera upgrades is actually the video features. And this is what has me teetering on the edge of spending that $4,500 to upgrade all of my cameras because the video functions on this are infinitely better than the Nikon D800. Let me first start off by saying that the LCD on this camera is significantly better than the Nikon D800. And not only is the screen better, but the live view is better. When you zoom into the picture on live view, it's not just zooming into this really low res picture that they had on the last camera. It actually seems to be zooming into the pixels on the sensor. So you can zoom in like four times and it's just as sharp. This thing's like a telescope when you really start using all 36 megapixels. It's pretty incredible. The screen has so much more detail, so much more color. It's so much brighter. It's so much easier to focus. It's easier to see your picture. It's easier to know if your final shot is actually in focus. That was something huge that I noticed right off the bat when I grabbed it out of the box. 
but it gets even better if you're the type of person like me that actually wants to shoot video with this thing. If you're the type of person that likes shooting slow motion, I definitely do. This camera can now shoot in uh, 60 frames per second at 1080p, whereas the D800 could only shoot 60 frames at 720p. I think it's a little ridiculous that my iPhone can shoot 120 frames per second at 720p. It seems like uh, this camera should be able to shoot at least 120 at 1080. I don't know why they can't add that feature in there. That would be a real game changer in my opinion. That would be one of those features that would just kind of push me over the edge and say, ah, I've got to have this camera. But it can't. It can just shoot a little bit faster, a little bit higher uh, bit depth. And so it's good. I appreciate 60 frames per second, but a little more would be appreciated. One other feature that I'm going to use all the time if I upgrade to the A10 is that it can now record for 30 minute sections rather than 20 minute sections. And I know for the average person, they probably don't care about that at all. But for me, somebody who films videos like this every single day, it's a feature that I would really like and I'd love to have a camera that could actually film forever. That would be even better. But 30 minutes is better than 20 minutes. So that's a feature I'm impressed with. Nikon's finally caught up to Canon and they've ad added a few of the video features that videographers have been asking for for a long time. So there's now zebra striping for highlights and blowouts. So if you're outside and you really can't see the screen very much, you can turn on zebra striping and you can see exactly what's blown out without being able to see the screen that well. Um, there's different settings for the microphone. If there's a lot of wind and stuff, it's supposed to diminish that. I haven't had a chance to play with that. Um, but it might, it might help out in certain situations. The D810 had a video profile called neutral. So when you're shooting video, you could get less colors, less contrast, you could get more detail in your video and then you could tweak it in post-production. The D810 has a new profile called flat and we found that it's significantly better than the neutral uh, feature on the D800. We shot the videos that you've seen today in this flat setting. So we wanted to test the video quality on this camera. In all honesty, I feel like still pictures have kind of reached this level where they're so good now in every single camera that what can they really do to make the pictures that much better? But video has a long way to go. There's a huge difference between the quality of this camera or what I thought the quality of this camera would be and something like this. This is the new Sony FS700. And so we thought, we'll go outside, we'll set up each camera on a tripod, we will take the exact same shot with the Nikon 800, the 810, the 5D Mark III, and the FS700. And what we're gonna do, everything that we shot with the Nikon, we shot with the exact same 70 to 200 millimeter lens. We have a Metabones speed booster on the front of this, and we use the exact same lens, the exact same Nikon lens. So there shouldn't be any sort of sharpness difference because we use different lenses. For the Canon, we did use the Canon version of the 70 to 200. But keep in mind that these lenses are made to shoot 36 megapixels and show tons and tons of detail. So even if there was a slight difference in sharpness per lens, you should not be able to see it in a 1080p video. For this first test, we shot every camera in its lowest ISO. For the Nikon D800, we used ISO 100. For the A10, we used 64. For the 5D Mark III, we used 100. And for the FS700, we used ISO 500, which is the lowest that it can go. The Nikon D800 and the 5D Mark III were battling for last place. I, I think the 5D Mark III was actually the worst, which was shocking to me because I've always really liked the footage out of that camera. But when you compare it side by side, I think it really was the worst. Second place, I, I can't believe I'm gonna say this, but I might actually choose the FS700, which is an $8,000 video camera. Um, there's no doubt that it had more detail. It captured more detail in the shadows and in the highlights. The dynamic range was just better. But when it comes to the overall color and the sharpness and uh, the density, I don't think there was really any comparison whatsoever. I really like the look of the Nikon D810, which is pretty crazy to me because I almost gave up shooting video on these SLRs and I thought, you know, maybe it's just worth me upgrading to pro video cameras. They probably shoot so much better, but that's not always the case, especially at the lowest ISO. The next test we did was a shake test. So I just wanted to see if there was any sort of rolling shutter or jello effect where when you pan, everything starts acting all wobbly. And the Nikon D800, A10, and 5D Mark III seemed pretty similar. 
Uh, I couldn't really tell much of a difference. They do really well when it comes to rolling shutter. And another huge shock to me, the Sony FS700 had the worst jello. It looked like one of my older DSLR cameras uh, when it came to rolling shutter. So I didn't expect that at all. Uh, once again, the Nikon D810 or DSLRs in general seem to beat the pro level camera when it came to rolling shutter. If you guys shoot any video with your Nikon D800, you know you can go into the menu, set the camera into DX mode, and what it's basically doing, instead of using the entire sensor, it's using the center of the sensor uh, to capture the video. And what that does is it helps zoom in to the footage. It can uh, give you a much deeper depth of field, but most videographers use it just for more reach. So if you have a 200 millimeter lens and you put it in DX mode, now it acts like a 300 millimeter lens. The problem with this feature is on the Nikon D800, when you drop into DX mode, there's a significant loss in quality. It's almost like it goes from 1080p down to 720p, and you can tell. You can tell that it looks blurry. You, you can tell that there's a lot more grain. It just doesn't look like the same camera at all. So that was a huge thing that we wanted to test, and we compared the D800 in DX mode to the D810 in DX mode, and I'm thrilled that Nikon has fixed that and we can't see any sort of issue or any difference in quality between FX and DX mode. So now we're gonna be shooting with the D810 and DX mode all the time, I'm sure. So now that we knew that the Nikon D810 takes incredibly clear and crisp video, much better than the Nikon D800, we wanted to test it in the high ISO range. Could this camera actually beat the 5D Mark III in video at high ISOs or the Sony FS700, which is incredible at high ISO. So as you can see here, we shot video with all four cameras. When you see the Nikon D800 at high ISOs, you can really see the video start to fall apart pretty quickly. The D810 is slightly better, but it's really not that much better. It's not worth upgrading to this camera just for the video high ISO performance. Again, it might be like a half stop to a stop better. Um, maybe a little bit more significant than you're gonna get with the still pictures. But when you open up the uh, Sony FS700 all the way up to 12,800 ISO, it looks amazing. It looks like, you know, the, the D800 at like 800 or 1600. It's really impressive. And so that right there is a reason why you might wanna go with a completely different camera for video if you're the type of person that's going to be shooting in low light. So this leads me back to the original question. Is this camera worth upgrading to? Basically, if I didn't own any DSLR or I was about to upgrade to a pro-level full-frame camera and I was thinking about Nikon, I wouldn't even hesitate. If I had the money, I would jump on the D810 right now for $3,300. And if you're considering buying a D800 for $3,000 right now or paying an extra $300 for the D810, don't even consider it. Go ahead and pay the $300 extra dollars and get the camera. But that's not really what your decision is. Your decision is, should I spend $3,300 on a Nikon D810, or can I buy a slightly used D800 for just $1,800? Think of the lens that you could afford if you saved $1,500 buying a camera. If you're the type of person that's not interested in video, I would go ahead and buy the used D800, put the rest of the money into strobes, or put the rest of the money into a brand new lens, and I think you're really going to enjoy that camera and you're not going to miss these small upgrades.